All right, lesson number two, entitled The Currency of Love, our main title, if you wish, uh, for our series, In Love for Life, Building or Rebuilding a Great Marriage. And I, I gave it that title, Building or Rebuilding, because some people uh, may be building a great marriage, but when I look into the audience that we have today, there may be some rebuilding going on uh, for uh, the crew here uh, this morning. A uh, little review of our last lesson, because we have some new faces in here. I said in our last lesson, I focused on the idea that uh, in order for marriages to last a lifetime, because God created marriage for a lifetime, uh, they need to be based on the kind of love where each partner has a disciplined commitment to seek the well-being of their spouse to an equal or greater level than they have for themselves. And to kind of break that down into a simpler bite, a simpler sound bite, the kind of love that we need in a marriage to really make it last a lifetime is the kind where an individual says, I want and I work to give you the same or better life that I want for myself. I mean, when your partner has that attitude, when both partners in the marriage have that kind of attitude, you've got something solid upon which you can build a great relationship. Remember I mentioned that God made marriage to last a lifetime, uh, but if we want to be happy for a lifetime, we need to love each other. So there are a lot of marriages that last a long time, but it's a long-term misery. You know, I've seen some of those. Uh, but that's not what we want as Christians. As Christians, we want a, a lifetime uh, where there is happiness and joy. Uh, and that can only happen when we have this kind of love as a basis. So in today's lesson, I want to talk about the currency of love. So far, I've explained that what marriages ought to be and what you, uh, what you need to work on in order to improve them. In our lesson today, we're going to look at a specific tool or a method to help us have that successful relationship that all of us, you know, I've never heard anybody say, boy, I, you know, they get married and I never hear anybody say, man, I cannot wait for the divorce. It's going to be so great you know, when we go through the divorce. Nobody ever says that. You know, even people, people who remarry, you know, people who've gone through a divorce and then they remarry, what do you think those people want in remarrying? They want to be happy. They, they want a successful marriage. You know, so say what you want for an individual who may be married multiple times. If they marry several times, usually it's because they're trying to find a partner, they're trying to be married in order to be happy. You know, I, I, don't, I don't even want to get into the debate about marriage and remarriage. I'm just talking about the emotion of it. Nobody ever gets married in order to fail. People get married because they, they want to find happiness. They want the things that God has given to married people. That's why they, that's why they marry. So we're going to look at some, a specific tool to help us have that kind of successful relationship. And um, also the tool that will help the relationship that we have at the moment. The key, of course, is love. I've already mentioned that the way to nurture and transfer that love from one to another is through the process of communication. So we all want love, but how do I give love to the other? How does the, the other one give love to me? How does that work? How do we transfer that love? Well, you know, the currency of love, the currency of love is communication. In other words, the substance of love and the way you move love around and the way you transfer it from one person to the other person you do that through communication. You know, in my counseling as a minister, I, I've seen people who have the capacity to love, they want to love, they need to love, but they don't communicate well. And for that reason, they have problems when it comes to love. You know, everything you do within marriage is done within the context of communication. Almost everything you do is in the context of communication. So let's look at communication within marriage and see if we can find ways to increase the currency of love. A couple of things that I want to, um, 
that I want to read, a couple of quotes. You can't know anyone unless you communicate with them. And you can't love anyone you don't know. Therefore, the depth of love existing between a couple will largely depend on the amount and the depth of their communication. Now, marriages are held together by love and love is built through communication. Uh, Proverbs chapter 27, verse five says, better is open rebuke than love that is concealed. Better open rebuke than love that is concealed. You know, there's an idea that saying I love you is the only way, even the best way, of communicating that love. And in our kind of audio visual world of TV and movies and now especially the internet, we place a great emphasis on oral communication, you know, words. We think if it isn't communicated verbally, in other words, we can't hear it, then for some reason it, uh, it's not really been communicated. So we need to understand that the language of love can be communicated in many different ways, not, not, just, by, not just by words. So uh, there's a book out, uh, it's been out for quite a while, but a really great book I, uh, that I can recommend to you. It's called The Five Love Languages by a man called, uh, named uh, Gary Chapman. And he says that love can be communicated in a variety of ways. I just want to go over those with you because he, he's talking about communication. He's talking about the currency of love. First of all, he says love can be communicated in words. Expressions of appreciation. Uh, not just I love you, but I appreciate you. Oh, thank you for doing that. I really, that was really helpful for me. Words of admiration, loyalty, affection, attraction. You know, people who use the words of love. You look great, I like your hair. Or she says, you know, I've always liked the way you look in that shirt. Or that's always been my favorite tie that you wear or whatever. Words to say I appreciate you, I love you, I think you're handsome or beautiful or, 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 or you know, you're important. All these words that communicate these ideas. But words aren't the only ways that we communicate love. Gifts, tokens of love and appreciation, things you buy, things you make for the other person that she takes the time to perhaps bake something and she may not be you know, a natural cook or anything, but she takes the time and effort to bake something that he really likes, whatever it is, I don't know, his mom's apple pie or whatever. That's a gift. I'm giving you the gift. So that's one way of appreciating or showing love or telling someone you love them. A third one is action. Actions to please and comfort the other person. Service in the home. Taking care of the other person's possessions. Hey, I brought your shirts to the dry cleaner today. You know, not a big thing. Saved you the time to do that. I took your car in to have it oiled and so you, don't, you won't have to mess with it because I know you need to go to the airport on Monday to, because you're leaving town, so I took care of that for you while you were at the office. Oh, thank you. Service, actions, time, another way, giving attention, paying attention, really listening, not just, yeah, yeah, I heard you. <laughs> Are you listening? Yeah, yeah, I heard you somehow does not convey you know, that I'm really paying attention. Yeah, yeah, I heard you while you're reading the paper or flipping through the, the box scores on ESPN or something. You know. <laughs> really paying attention. Actually, the kind of attention where you say to the other person, so tell me about your day. That kind of attention. Or when he says, so you went to your mom's, so what did she say about such and such a thing? Oh, you want to hear what my mother said? Yeah, yeah, I want to hear it, I want to know it. 
You know this business of, oh, it's not quantity time, it's quality time. Uh, that's the worst expression I've ever heard. You know why? Because quantity time is quality time. <laughs> and then of course, physical affection, touching, holding, sexual intimacy of course, you know, He's sitting in the chair, you're going behind the chair, you, you give him a three second massage on the shoulders and you walk on. She's reading her book, she's doing something, you walk by, you're sitting down, you're grabbing a paper, your tablet or whatever to read, and you just reach over and you put your hand on her arm. You know, that communicates something. That says, I, I want to, I want to, feel the warmth of your body. It's a, what we call non-sexual uh, affection. Very, very meaningful as, as something that you communicate to an individual. Now psychologists tell us that one of these, one of these languages here is our primary language for love. In other words, one of these things is our hot button that satisfies our need to know that we are loved. Remember what I just said, our need to know that we're loved. Usually, when love dies in a couple, it's because we're no longer sure that we loved or that we are loved. And usually the reason for that is our hot button is not getting touched anymore. So we know that we can express or we can receive all of these things, but usually one of these things is the one that convinces us that we are loved, and if it isn't pressed, we will not feel love no matter what the other person does or what the other person says. So unless we're spoken to in our love language, we'll not feel love. It's very important to feel that we are loved. I got to feel it. Isn't that what people say a lot of times when you know, things are starting to break down, that conversation that people have telling each other that the relationship is a little uh, rocky, one person will say to the other person, you know, I'm just not feeling it. What do you mean you're not feeling it? You know, yeah, what they're saying is, you know that, that button that gets pressed that inside of me says, I am loved, I'm sure I am loved. That button is not getting pressed anymore. That's what they're saying. So let me give you some examples of the language of love in action, okay? Hypothetical couple. So the wife's hot button, in our you know, couple A here, the wife's hot button for knowing that she's loved is words, let's just say. It's words. Poems, love notes, saying sweet things, compliments on her looks, confessions of desire, the repeated words of love. She's all about words, words, that's her hot button, words. And then in couple A we have the husband. The husband, well he grew up in a house where his dad was the strong and silent type. No fancy words in that house. So the husband has grown up like his dad in this particular way and he has learned to say I love you not with words but with service, deeds. He fixes her car, he takes care of the house, he does a lot of repair on her mother's house. You understand what I'm saying? He serves, he does things, he does the dirty jobs. Now what tends to happen in this relationship is that she's not going to feel love because he's not expressing it in the way that she needs it to be expressed. Remember, she's all about words. She doesn't need new tires on her car. New tires on our car are great. That's, what, that's not what makes her feel loved. So she's going to question his love and he'll point out all the things that he does for her. What do you mean do I love you? 
You got brand new Goodyears on your, tie, on your car. And didn't I put in the ramp for your mom's wheelchair? What do you mean? But she's not going to be satisfied because he's not speaking in her language of love. So this, believe it or not, is how affairs begin. Somebody else discovers your hot button and they start hitting your hot button. And you like it. You like it because you're feeling something that you don't feel at home. That's just how it works. Now an interesting feature about this language of love business. People tend to receive their love messages in the same way that they give their love messages. See what I'm saying? So let's go back to our couple and see how this works. Remember, she receives love through words. So this is usually the way she gives it and he receives it through actions and service. So usually this is how he receives or this is how he recognizes love. So watch what happens in a couple like this. And I mean, you know, I'm giving you kind of a general example here. She tells him that she loves him and she gives him mushy birthday cards and she wants to talk about their relationship. Let's talk about us, okay? But she's not interested in hanging out in the garage with him or working on projects in the shop. And he needs to hear I love you by her involvement with him in his stuff, his things. Let's go down to AutoZone. I got to buy some things for your car. We'll go together. We'll stop at Taco Bell and get some, you know. So in the end, he feels smothered by her words and she feels rejected by his silence. Now, you see what's happening here? Both of them are trying to love, but each is missing the point and the sad thing is they don't realize it. Now, I've told you what, you know, some, some people, you know, they want to love and they need to love and they desire to give love, but they fail because they can't seem to communicate it well or they're not communicating it in the way that the other person needs to hear it. Now the answer for them, you know, believe it or not, is not to start loving. You know, sometimes the counselor will say, well, you've you got to start loving your wife. What do you mean? I already love my wife, the guy will say. They're already trying to do that. And believe it or not, the answer is also not to love differently. Because I don't think people can change their basic personality in order to accomplish this. You know, the strong, silent type, he's going, he or she, you know, there are women like that too, the strong silent type are always going to be the strong silent type. You're not going to turn them into talkative, let's talk about our relationship type people. That's not the way they are. What I, there's no use saying that to this group here. I'm looking around, I don't even see, all I see are married people. But if I do this for a, you know, a younger crowd, not married yet type thing, you know, first time marriages, I used to do this for a college group, all the engaged college students at OC. And at, at this point I would say to them, okay, I want all of you people, they're all engaged to be married. I want all of you to turn around and look at each other and just look at each other for a minute. You know, and they just stare at each other for a minute and they'd start to giggle. You know. I'd say, okay, here's, here's the big truth now I'm going to lay on you. What you see is what you're going to get. So if you think you're going into a marriage and your job is going to be to change the person in front of you, good luck with that. That's not going to happen. They are who they are. They can improve who they are. You can improve yourself, but you can't change yourself. Do you understand? There's a difference there. So touchy-feely people can't just change the way they are. It's not a superficial thing. It's just the way they are. The answer, 
I believe, to this problem is to find ways to communicate about loving each other so that we will understand and hopefully better receive and give the love we have to give and need for ourselves. As the slide says, love improves when communication improves. And the way to do this is to make communication you do have more effective and more productive in the sense that you're consciously improving the communication bridge between you. You have to communicate better. Now there are ways to improve communication between you and your spouse. I'll give you three basic elements that'll make you, uh, your um, communication uh, better. Three things that'll help you to connect more efficiently and more effectively at every level. First of these communication techniques is be totally honest. Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love. Speaking the truth in love. For communication to be uh, productive, you need to be honest, even if it's risky. Woo. Even if it's risky. She loves baking cherry pies. She just loves, it's her favorite pie to make. Her dad loved it, her grandpa loved it. She just knows, how, she makes the best. She won a prize for cherry making pie at the fair. And so she's going to make him cherry pie. And because he knows that her mom made it and her grandma made it and she's got a blue ribbon in the box that says, you know, champion cherry pie maker, you know, Oklahoma State Fair 1999, you know, he's going to eat the cherry pie. Ooh, why you, you sure do make the best cherry pie, but one day he will have to speak the truth in love, right? And he'll have to say, you know, baby, I got to tell you something, and I don't want to hurt you. I hate cherries. <laughs> I can't stand cherries. I've been eating a cherry pie just to make you happy, baby. You understand what I'm saying? I, I'm getting to be like Marty. All my examples revolve around food. <laughs> a lot of times we say what the other person wants to hear so we can get what we want. So we can get what we want. So we'll fudge on the truth so we can get what we want. Now this works in the short term, but it's disastrous for a long-term relationship. The best example of this is when we compare the hierarchy of needs that men and women say that they need from each other. There was a survey a while back that showed what men and women acknowledge privately as their top five needs, but rarely acknowledge to each other because they are embarrassed. You understand the premise here? A survey asked married couples, what do you need to be happy? I don't mean what would you like. I mean, I would like a beach house in Tampa that I could go to whenever I would like that, but I don't need that to be happy. You understand what I'm saying? Something you need is like oxygen. I need, if I don't have oxygen, I can't survive. If I don't have food, I can't survive. So they, they wanted five needs, five emotional type spiritual you know, needs that women have and that men have that they have to have, otherwise they can't survive in the marriage. Okay? So here were the answers. Women and men. So we start with the women. The women said top five needs. Number one, affection. Not necessarily sexual intimacy, but affection. Romance, cuddling, holding, touching. Remember I said the non-sexual affection that says, I love you because of you. Not because of what you're, you can give me, but I love you because of you. Number two, <clears throat> attention. The sharing of thoughts. Really listening, 
Very important, women said. I know that you're really paying attention to what I'm saying. Even if what we're talking about is not necessarily our budget or world affairs, just the little things that I did you know, over at my mom's. You're really listening to me. Number three, trust. Trust, women said trust is very, very important. Her world, especially when there are children, is supported by him. And I understand in this day and age, we've got you know, two income houses and so on and so forth, but still, the men, still, majority-wise, are still the primary earners. And especially when women have small children and they're taking care of small children, even if they have a job, the, the, the care of those children is on them. And so trust is very, very important. She has to have confidence in him. That's what they say. Number four, financial security. In other words, women said they want enough to live on and provide for the family. And an interesting thing that came in with this uh, survey was that women said they want enough to give the children an advantage. In other words, not just enough to live, but enough so that little Susie can have piano lessons and, the, and little Bobby can, you know, I don't know, we can play sports or whatever. You know, just the little advantages in life. Maybe somebody's a gifted child. Wow, let's, let's kind of get them into a, a situation where they can you know, really uh, uh, profit from their, uh, their skills and their gifts. And then number five, you, know, you could have had 10, but just picked five, uh, involvement. Women said it was important for their husbands to be involved in the home and in family matters. Not just, you know, I, I take care of the work, you take care of the house, I don't want to hear about it, just take care of the house. Women said, no, I want my husband to actually be involved in the house. He doesn't have to do the dishes or whatever, but I want him to know what's going on in our home, especially where, when there are children. I want, an, I want him to know. And women said they wanted their husbands to provide leadership. And this is, not, this is not Christian women, this is a general survey. Women felt safe and comfortable when their husbands provided true moral leadership in their homes. So those are the five needs that women said that they need. Okay, now we go to the men. Would everybody like to guess what the number one need was? Right, sexual fulfillment. Now, I want to tell you something. Not affection, not non-sexual affection. No, 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 no. Sexual fulfillment. Now, before you run away with this idea, I need to tell you something. This is number one because this is the way that God made men. It's not number one because men are you know, sex crazy. It's because that's how God made them. The natural production of seminal fluid in a man causes the constant need for gratification. It's the greatest single struggle that each man must deal with in order to mature both emotionally and socially and spiritually. You know, I used to tell my sons as they grew up, you're going to have to learn to deal with the green monster. You know, the monster inside of you, that sexual being that is always demanding satisfaction. You're going to have to you know, learn self-control. And uh, before they were married, you know, we talk about this and I said, just because you're married, you think, you think everything's over after you're married, you don't need to practice any type of self-control or any type of personal discipline. After you're married, uh, no. All kinds of temptation. Never mind from other people. Today, <clears throat> excuse me, with the internet and movies, I mean, there's all kind of pornography uh, going on, so on and so forth. I don't want to go too deep into this subject. That's the subject for another lesson. But sexual fulfillment, they said that was number one. Number two, they said a playmate. Guys said they wanted their wives to be their buddies, their friend. Come here, come here, look at this, look at this. That's that, that feeling, you know. They wanted to feel that their wives you know, were in with them on their things, their stuff. Number three, men said important to them 
was that their wives remain attractive. A wife's looks and demeanor either built up a man's pride or brought it down. They didn't say, I want my wife to look like a supermodel. They didn't say that. They said, I want my wife, like I want to know that my wife is caring for her appearance. That's what was important to them, that it was important to my wife the way she looked, whether she's tall or short or whatever. I want to know that my wife cares how she looks because that is a reflection on me. Funny how that works, eh? Women, that was further down in the, for women, you know, but for men, this was very important. Number four, domestic support. Men said, you know what? I want a quiet, clean, accepting home. When I come home, they said, basically, I want to feel welcome. I, I, I don't want to walk back into my house after work and, and, and see World War III going on. <laughs> Now, of course, we had four children, Lisa and I, and you know, in the space of five years, so they were all one after the other. And you talk about World War III in somebody's house when you got you know, four kids under the age of six with mom, a full-time homemaker, and I was, in, I was going to the office all day long. I want to tell you, by the time I got home, she was just bursting with, do you know what Paul did? And he did this, and she did that. And, you know, and the first few years, you know, I, I was worn out. And I mean, not to say she wasn't worn out, but eventually, because we talked, you know, speaking the truth in love, you know, I said to her, if you could just give me just a minute to get in so that I could just get into the house, get off the day's work, get into my you know, work clothes or house clothes or whatever, just give me a moment to catch my breath before you apprise me of everything. I don't mind, I'll deal with stuff and I want to, I want to know what's going on, but just give me that, trans, you know, that transfer moment from work to home. And she got it, she understood. We didn't talk about you know, what the kids did or the teacher called or you know, whatever, you know, stuff like that. She made space for me to come, to, to come home and I have to give Lee's credit. She welcomed me almost like I was a guest. I would look forward to going home because when I'd walk in the door, there was a smile. Hey, you're home. Good to see you. A hug, a kiss. You know, even if in 20 minutes from now, she's going to say, OK, so one of the kids threw the baseball through the plate glass window of the neighbor. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> she waited a little bit until she gave me the news. And I always felt welcome in my own home. And I always saw that she had made an effort so that when I walked in, somehow it didn't look like crisis. And then number five, men said they want admiration, respect. I mean, in little things, it's like, hey, 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 come here. I, 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 I mowed the lawn and I trimmed the hedges. Come and see. Oh, good, good job. Way to go, you know, man. <laughs> they needed Approval, they needed attaboys from their wives. Even though the lawn's being mowed 200 times now. Hey, did a nice job on the lawn. Oh, I noticed you, 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 know, you trimmed some of those big branches off. Hey, yeah, yeah, had to get, that was tough getting up there. You know? So what the survey showed were things um, that we kind of knew, didn't we? From experience and from observation, we saw that Men are generally immature and more self-centered. <laughs> they want attention and gratification. They're not always willing to give in exchange for, for, for these things. You know? So this survey showed that men, they need a little coaching. But it also showed something about women. Women were more high-minded and usually were willing to invest more to make the marriage work. In my experience, it's usually the woman that will come in first if the marriage is in trouble. And then eventually she'll drag that old boy in, you know, kicking and screaming to kind of talk about the relationship. So women, you know, they're, you know, they, they work at it a little harder than the men do. But women tend to ask for conflicting things. They want security and advantages for their children which places a greater burden on the husband if he's the primary earner. 
but at the same time they want him to be at home more and more involved, which requires time. Maybe that's the time that he needs to be at work making that extra money to take care of the advantages. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes women need to understand that they can't have it both ways. He can't be home early from work every night and be home every weekend and do all the stuff, but at the same time have the extra money for the ballet lessons and the, you know, the, the private tutors. You understand what I'm saying? Okay, number two, we're running behind a little here. Productive communication needs to be clear. So it needs to be honest, it needs to be clear. More arguments and division and hurt feelings come from communication that is simply unclear rather than intended insults. Those who speak need to make sure that the hearer has indeed understood what was said and what the meaning was. More times than not, after you settle an argument, isn't this the scenario? One person says, well, wait a minute, I thought you said this. And then the other person said, no, 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 I didn't mean that, I meant this over here. Oh, oh, I didn't, I didn't, I'm sorry, I spoke too quickly, or I, you know, I, I blew off, you know, I, I flew off the handle because I thought you were saying this. So especially about touchy things, you know, you need to be careful that you're communicating clearly. Practice feedback. If it's something that's very sensitive, and you've got to say something that's sensitive, then don't be afraid to say, okay, uh, I, I, let me tell you, and you tell them, and then you say, all right, tell me what I just said. Tell me what I just said. And that's not a way of accusing your partner of being dumb or something. You want to make sure that they actually understood not just the words, but the intent of what you said. So honest communication, clear communication and complete communication. We must tell the truth, we must express it clearly, but we've got to say it all. Some don't agree on this, but when one area is taboo or, you know, you know when, when uh, between a, a partners, one person says, okay, don't go there. We're not going to talk about that, about me. When there are too many don't go there issues between a couple, the communication eventually just shuts down because it creates frustration and resentment and a gradual closing down of the communication network between people because one party or the other has the off limits. So you can't talk about that, you know, my drinking or your cursing or whatever. You know, we can't talk about those things. You can't talk about how your mother interferes in our life. You know, oh, don't go there. You can't talk about my mother. We're not going to have any discussion about her. Really? I'll tell you something. Nothing kills love more than secrecy because love cannot grow in the shadows. Secrecy breeds mistrust and you cannot create, maintain, or grow love in an environment of mistrust. You need honesty. There's no greater joy or protection than a loving partner with whom we can share all of our hearts, the good and the bad. So let me summarize here. I want to remind you that one of the best witnesses of our Christian faith is a loving marriage. Because most of you will not have the opportunity to get into a pulpit and preach the gospel or be on TV or something like that. Most people, the thing they know about you is your marriage. And if you have a happy, loving marriage, that's probably the strongest witness you have for Christ with other, with other people. And the point I want to make with this is that solid communication, good communication is what builds love in a marriage. Okay, um, two uh, little assignments that you have. On the back of your worksheet, and if you didn't get a worksheet, let me know, I've got, I'll have a couple more done. On the back of your worksheet, you have a, um, a communication exercise um, that I want you to do. And uh, this is the way I want you to do it. I want you to, you know, each husband and wife, you each have your own. Do your own separately. 
and then find a time where the kids aren't running around or there's no traffic or you have about a you know, good hour quiet and share your answers one with another. Now when I, I call this the productive communication worksheet because this worksheet, if you answer those questions and share them with your partner, will begin a discussion between you that you don't normally have. You don't normally talk about the things that I have given you to talk about on this sheet. And I'm not going to ask you the results next week. Nobody gets a score. This is if you want to do this, if you want to see uh, 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 some improvement in your communication skills, try this exercise. And then the second homework assignment that I have for you is I want you to read the book of Ruth in the Old Testament. It's not very long, just a few chapters. Next week we'll be doing the book of Ruth in a lesson entitled uh, the uh, Chords of Love, okay, Chords of Love. And so um, uh, I'll be taking a lot of the material out of the book of Ruth, but we won't have time to be reading it during class. So please read it ahead of time and then we'll uh, head into that next week. Well, thank you for your attention. Please talk to each other, communicate.